<clears throat> Romans 15, from verse 14. I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another. Yet I have written you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me. To be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so that the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. By the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God, So from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I fully proclaim the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay. So one more, just a reminder, this is a liturgy that we do as Presbyterians, but it's more than just a Presbyterian liturgy. Uh, when we do read, we say this is God's word. Because uh, we want to believe that God is speaking right now. And the response from the congregation is, uh, thanks be to God. So let's practice that one more time. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. That now encourages me to preach. <laughs> Which, and I start with this question. It's like, is it right for Paul or any Christ follower to be ambitious? You heard the word right there, right? Ambition. I mean, I've grown up thinking that ambition is a, a dirty word. You've got to be humble. But Paul says here, my ambition is to preach where Christ has not been preached, to be the founding pastor of a church. I don't want to play second fiddle. I don't want to be the second pastor of a church because when the church anniversary is celebrated, no one remembers the second pastor of the church. Everybody recalls the founding pastor. I want to be that. Wow, he is ambitious. Is it okay for a Christ follower to be ambitious? He is so ambitious that It almost sounds so arrogant. In fact, he himself says, right? I've been bold to speak to you about all these things. And what does he say? He tells the Roman church, and he's not even their pastor, and tells them what to do. It would be kind of like me uh, writing to the Summit Church, which is one of the big churches in this area, and saying to them, God has called me to be the pastor of Raleigh, and I'm telling you that you are contradicting the gospel. Right? What would happen? Arrogant. Too bold. Yeah, Paul, at the end, he says, but you know, uh, I, I think better of you. You are great. You've been doing great. So he gives him a high five, pat in the back, and says, good job, like any good coach. But the thing is, he's not their coach. He's in the wrong dugout. Paul is so ambitious that he is bold to the point of arrogance. And let's not, um, you know, couch uh, his words to make it softer. Uh, in fact, Karl Barth, he's one of the great theologians and a commentator in Rome, he says, Romans, Book of Romans, he says this. He says that here we see Pauline glory so evidently self-conscious, so much so that it show, throws a shadow on everything that is said in the epistle. Paul is all around what we just read. The word I, my, my, I, all around. So the question is, is it okay, is it right, For Paul or any of us Christ followers to be so ambitious. Are we supposed to be humble? Oh, Paul is humble, of course, right? He says here, I do it for the glory of Christ. He says in verse 17, look, he's humble. And when you read that, to that point, it sounds okay, but he goes on, in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done. Does this sound like he's talking uh, Christianese, right? He's speaking the Christian lingo, right? So he's putting God in the beginning, God in the end, but all in the middle, it's about me. And so as long as you put the bracket God, whatever you say is no gloating, right? Do you ever know of people who do that, right? They say God, but they speak 30, 40 minutes about themselves. Do you know anyone like that? It's not yourself, right? It's never ourselves. It's always someone else. Is this Right? For Paul to be so ambitious. By the power of signs and wonder, through the power of the Spirit of God, so from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, the most northwestern part of Greece, I went and preached and found the churches and planted churches. Is it right for Paul to be so ambitious? 
Carl Barth says another thing. He says, maybe right, the reason why we are so uncomfortable with Paul is because we are proud of our humility. We look at the figure of Paul and it makes, it makes, looks intolerable because we are proud of our humility. Maybe we got the whole concept of humility wrong. Maybe humility is not the contradiction of ambition. Maybe humility is wedded for life to ambition and they strengthen each other. Maybe if there's no ambition, there's no humility. If there's no humility, There is no ambition. Does Christ ever kill ambition? Does Christ say, don't desire greatness? We know the story that's familiar, right? The 12 go follow Jesus and they talk about who's the greatest among them. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. And what is his answer to them? Don't seek greatness. Don't seek, try to desire those things. He says, if you really want to be great, he's saying, you know your argument about who's great? It's so small. Your ambition is so small. Like, between you 12, who's better? Like, who's the, who's the biggest uh, tadpole in the palm-sized pond? That's what you're arguing for? No, I want you to be greater. I want you to have greater ambition. If you really want to be great, serve. And it's true, isn't it? It takes a great man to kneel and wash the feet of redneck fishermen. It takes a great man to do that. When the young, rich ruler comes to Jesus and he says, hey, you know, what can I do to have eternal life? And he sees that all the things that he's accomplished and all the things he's done with his life, and he says, okay, now, if you want to go to the next step, it's important here, right? He doesn't say all of that is unimportant and throw it all down and become simple and humble and lose everything and become poor for the sake of poverty. He doesn't say that. He says, Okay, I want you to throw all of that away for something bigger. I want you to have a bigger ambition than just to live well. I want you to have the adventure of a lifetime which no amount of golden coins can buy. Follow me. I'll show you what greatness is. Christ calls us for greater ambition and greatness. St. Francis of Assisi, He gave up his father's upper middle class life and his robe and put on the beggar's robe and begged in the street and began preaching. Not because he said, I don't want to be so worldly ambitious. Not because he wanted a simple poverty life, but because being like his father, except just being just a little richer, was just not ambitious enough for him. See, he wanted to change the church. He wanted to change the world. And that's why in 1219, he went into the court of Sultan and he preached to the king of all the Muslim empires saying, Christ is not just a prophet, he is the son of God. He went there because he believed he could make the Sultan take communion and stop the crusades. You want to talk about ambition? He was ambitious. He was so humble That his ambition embraced the impossible. So humble that his ambition embraced the impossible. No, no, no. Christ wants us to be ambitious because true humility creates that. And you know, me, I grew up in a church where I, you know, I believe these two are contradictions. And it's taken me a long time to get rid of that false theology. And it's worse because, you know, we Asians, this false theology of humility of taking the back seat, always losing, turning the other cheek, all of this false humility, it gets so mixed, it mixed so well with this uh, Asian understanding of don't stick out, right? It, it, we say the language of unity, but it's really conformity. So in Japan, there's a saying that goes, if the hammer that sticks out gets, I mean, I'm sorry, the nail that gets, sticks out gets hammered. And so with that type of teaching, we always ask, it, don't stand out, don't stick out, just fit in with the crowd. I remember in Arizona, a relatively uh, successful uh, neurologist said to me, you know, when, my, when, my, when I was young, my dad keeps saying, always be second. Always be Korean American, always be second. Never be first, because if you're first, everybody's aiming for you. If you're second, you're close enough to the top, but no one's aiming for you. Always be second. 
And he thought like, okay. But he realized even as an adult, that has gotten into him. So every time there's an opportunity, he's always wondering, will this make me first or second? Humility does not contradict ambition. In fact, sincere humility creates great ambition. Uh, Jim Collins, a business guru, management guru, he wrote the book Good to Great, and he looked at companies, how do they jump from good company to great company? And looked at many different factors, one of the most essential factors was leadership. He called it leadership level five. And he, in it, he discovered something that surprised him, and he called it the paradoxical balance between personal humility and professional will. Uh, in other words, humility and ambition. And what the secular sociological study sh- is showing is basically what we're seeing in the Bible and what we're seeing in the life of Paul. Ambition and humility go together. All right, so how, how does it? How does it go together in Paul? All right, at least from the hour into there's two things, two principles that drives Paul, right? The first thing is this. He says very clearly, the glory of Christ. The first thing is he does everything for the glory of Christ. Now, consider that statement. Right? When you consider that statement to other ambitions that we might have, uh, to be successful in the world, the biggest company, to plant the largest church or the most churches, whatever ambition that you might have, the most money or the biggest house in this community, whatever ambition that you might have, when you compare that type of ambition to this uh, glory Christ, it does sound a little more tame. It does sound humble, and it is humble. It is. Because you take the self out of the, the center, and it's all about Christ. It is humility. Right? And, and in one sense, that could distinguish false humility and genuine humility. False humility still wants you guys to praise me for my conspicuous humility. False humility still has a center. Look at what I accomplished by the grit of my moral strength. Uh, genuine humility is not even aware of being humble. Because the focus is always on Christ. So it is humble. More tame than great companies. But then, when you think about it, doesn't that very humble statement, it's only for Christ, make you free to be great and to desire great things? Because it's for Christ. Don't you want to do everything and anything you can do in your own power and beyond? You want to do great things. You want to plant many churches because it brings honors to Christ. You want to build great companies because it brings honor to Christ. And you have all these employees which you can impact through your life and through your words. You want to do all this for the glory. I want the biggest company for the glory of Christ. See, when you have that at the center, you are humble and ambitious at the same time. We we know this. This phenomenon is is something that's familiar to us. When you put something as a center outside of yourself, uh, like... Um, you guys know this commercial a few years ago? It's a commercial of this uh, kind of older men, right? They're uh, rowing the boat or paddling their bike, and they're doing it at leisurely speed. And then suddenly a shot of t- t- storm sh- comes in, and they row faster and pedal faster because a woman comes by. Did you ever see that commercial? No? Okay. <laughs> that didn't work. <laughs> well, that kind of points to, you know, about a man, if he falls in love with the woman, And he falls in love with the winner, and she becomes centered, and she wants to, he wants to do everything that he can do. And in desiring to delight and give joy to her, he seeks and desires to do great things. And so that great poem by a proclaimer, you know this song? He says, I will work. I'm going to be the man who works. I'm going to be the man who works hard for you. And when the money comes in to the work that I do, I give almost every penny to you. I'll walk 500 miles, and I'll walk another 500 miles just to be the man who walked 1,000 miles for you. So what if Christ is that? Then Paul would say, I will walk 1,000 miles. I will walk to the edge of the known world if it's for you, Christ. So you and I have to make a decision. What What are we living for? At some point in our life, we have to say, this is my life's ultimate goal, and then recommit to it every single day. And if it's Christ's glory, then you're both humble and ambitious. In fact, I would even say that if you're not ambitious enough, that you might not have Christ's glory as your center. The danger is that we are not ambitious enough. The danger is we're not 
seeking greatness, enough greatness. Um, uh, Alan was a good manager. He manages a couple of uh, grocery stores in Tennessee and then also loves truck stops from Kentucky and South Carolina. He was a rabid sports fan and he even had a website set up for all the sports fanatics like himself to get together and to share. He even um, started a, a um, petition to set up a I think the coach was, uh, well, I think Draylen, I don't even know the coach, University of Texas coach statue set, created and set right in front of the stadium. He was such an avid fan that he would do all these things in his spare time. But then as he thought about his life, he was wondering that all this uh, passion, the desire to do things for the sports, if it was hiding a deeper hunger. And so he started going to church. And when he went to church, he started praying to God. And as he prayed to God, he experienced God in such a powerful way, it felt so physical that he said it felt like a heart attack. And so now he desired to come to know God more, but still he felt incomplete and angry. And angry at himself because, see, he was a tailgater. Not just a sports tailgater, the barbecuing type, but the one who goes up to your bumper type. He would always go fast, 15 to 20 miles per hour over the speed limit. And if there's someone out there, he would honk. And if he doesn't move, he would chase the person. And his words would be, move or blow up. I don't care. Just get out of my way. And he felt like this is not quite right with following Christ. So he went to um, Gethsemane Abbey uh, Monastery. And there, during the prayer time, he again experienced God, and he became ambitious, and he made three vows that he would do daily. First, read the Bible. Second, make his bed. Third, stop tailgating. Are those ambitious goals? You betcha. (laughs) For him it was. Let me ask you, can any of you guys make a vow right now to read the Bible every day? So simple, so big, but we don't. Because maybe Christ's glory is still not our life's goal yet. In fact, turn to the person next to you and say, I live for Christ's glory. Say that to the person next to you. I live for Christ's glory. Come on, be confident. (laughs) Don't whisper it. (laughs) A second thing about this is that Paul says here, by the power of the Spirit, even as he speaks about all that he has done, the places, the words, and deeds, he says, by the power of the Spirit. By the power of the Spirit. Knowing that on your own you are powerless is a place of humility. Knowing that you are limited in your resources. Where ambition kind of rottens to arrogance is right here. When you feel like you've got to where you are by your own bootstraps. That it was you. It was your strength. That it was because you were smarter, worked harder, and more disciplined. All those are important factors, but that's not what you ultimately got you. At the end, all of us are dependent and powerless. All of us. So all of us are here alive because when we were infant, there was someone who took care of us 24-7. None of us survived infancy through our own power. And yes, as we get older, as we get older, we become less helpless. but we're still essentially in need of help and weak. And so any one of us, I don't care how much money you might have or what degree you have, if you go on the street and you get hit by a truck, you're going to die. Like any other man and woman. We are weak. But that's where, if we don't remember that, think about all those people who went up and then fell catastrophically. What led to that? It's because as they went up, They began to think that, hey, I got it by my own strength. I deserve this. I did it because I was better or smarter or more disciplined than all these other people and not considering all the other factors that could have led to it. And then once you get there and once you start thinking it's you, what happens? Fear sets in. Fear sets in. If I did it, what if I lose it? If it's by my own power. And so once the fear sets in, what happens is you have to prove to yourself that what you said is true, that you got it by, there by your own strength. And so what you do is you want to get to the next level. You think like, if you go to the next level, then I can truly prove that I did it by my own strength. But at that time, it's not ambition that's pushing you, is it? It's fear as you go up. But once you get to the point when you think it's your own power and fear is the one that pushes you up and then you start becoming arrogant and there's no one there to help and it really is, when you come down to it then, at that point, just you, you will fall. 
Many leaders have fallen because of arrogance. Pride leads to fall. But ambition, ambition starts with this, humility. We understand that it's not by our own power. It's only by Christ's power. And once we understand that, then, hey, I can be ambitious. I can try to seek great things because it's not about my, the limitation of my uh, ability, but it's about God's power. And if God's power is eternal, why not? Why not go to Sultan and let's see what happens? That's, that's the second principle. That while our source of power is Christ. All right, so now quickly then, how do we practice this? Well, there's one thing, teamwork, and we're going to look at Romans chapter 16, looking at that. And there's prayer, uh, that, these two things we'll look at subsequent weeks. But today, I want to just hit this one thing, okay? How do we really um, activate these two principles, right? It's glory of Christ and by the power of the Spirit. And glory of Christ and the power of the Spirit. Do this. Set a goal so big that you are almost guaranteed to fail. Set a goal so huge that you're almost guaranteed to fail. Because you see, if you set a goal that's, that you can meet on your own, then you don't need Christ's power. You're not seeking Christ's glory. It just kind of comes back to you. Wow, look what Sam did. Right? If my goal is simply just walking, no one's going to applaud. <laughs> if it's something that I can do with my own power, people will applaud me. But if I set a goal that seems impossible to you. At that point, you are forced to seek the Christ's power. And you are forced to see that maybe this thing is so huge that it's not going to be accomplished in your life. And you're okay. Why? Because you're not seeking the applauses of men. You might go there and die failing, but that's okay because your goal is Christ's glory. So you've got to set a goal that is so big that you're almost guaranteed to fail. Now, I don't mean that you can't see it. Of course, you should see it. Right? Um, St. Francis, he saw it. St. Francis of Assisi, he saw it. He saw the sultan taking communion. Paul saw a church being planted in Spain. But when they saw it, they realized that, man, that looks impossible. And that's why they went for it. That's why they went for it. Now, here's a question, though. Did they succeed or fail? Sultan didn't get converted. Let's just focus on Paul. Did Paul ever make it to Spain? Paul didn't make it to Spain. So he failed. But was it a failure? Here's a good thing about being humble and ambitious. See, if you are not humble and just arrogant, then a failure always reflects back on you. A recent study showed that entrepreneurs are more likely to be depressed because everything of their worth and value depends upon what they accomplish. And if they don't accomplish, I know your stories of successful entrepreneurs. For every one of them, there are hundreds, hundreds who fail and live in depression. But if you have humility, if it fails, you're like, well, I guess not the will of God. Next. You're not afraid of failure. But here's another beautiful thing, though. When you try for something big and you fail, and although the world might think it's a failure, but when you consider it, it wasn't a failure at all. A success that you and I didn't even plan comes out. Think about it. Paul doesn't make it to Spain, so he ends up in Rome. And what does he do in Rome? Uh, He speaks and proclaims the gospel to Caesar. He wasn't planning on that. Yes, he went there with shackles, But yet he stood before Caesar, and many citizens would never have an audience with Caesar. And the Caesar had to listen to him because he was speaking as a defense. (laughs) And he told them about Christ the gospel. He didn't get to preach in Spain, but he got to preach before Caesar. Is that a failure? I don't think so. Even this letter to Rome that we've been studying all this time, this letter, think about it. If he wasn't thinking of going to Spain, he would have never written this. If his goal was even just Rome, then he would not have written all this because he would have all the time in the world. He would go and say, I'm going to tell you what I believe. Wait for me. It would have been just a simple introductory letter, but because he knows he will be there, well, most people want to settle down. He says, I don't want to settle down in Rome. It may be the greatest city or things to see. I don't want to settle down, but I'm going to go through. But so you know what I'm about, I'm going to write and tell you what the gospel is. 
And through our church history, this letter has renewed the church every time the church has lost its grip in the gospel. Every time the church was compromising and falling into the world, this letter has renewed her. Because Paul wanted to go to Spain and failed. Have an ambition, a great ambition for the glory of Christ. Power of the Spirit will be with you. And when you fail, honor God. Because that's success. So, okay, too quickly. I know it went by. Two quick things. One, I want all of you guys to have a personal ambition for your life. You know, think about it. And specifically, have an ambition to proclaim the gospel to all those around you. you know, now, I'm not talking about those people who kind of pass by your life. Then those people, you just throw the seed. It could be a love. It could be a prayer. It could be kindness. But those people that you meet regularly, it's your responsibility and my responsibility. Be ambitious for your company. That every person in your company or every person in your department, that every person in your neighborhood will come to know Christ through you. Why not have such a big ambition? You know, um, me, I was was thinking like this. I'm going to be kind to my neighbors. I don't have to tell the gospel to every one of them. And again, what the whole thing, scattering the day, someone else will come. That is true. But I realized I'm running into them every day. That means it's my responsibility to someday to tell them. It's not the whole gospel. At least tell them that God loves them. So I got that ambition. Again, the, the word of God, it was, you know, it challenged me. And so this past week, there's a, there's a sister who's alone and who doesn't, uh, who's away from the uh, house for long stretches. We get her packages and mails for her. And so we get, always give it to her. And then this time I just said, hey, is there anything that I could pray for? And she said, yes, pray for a project that I'm going through, that the contract will go through. I said, I'll pray for that. The next day, she comes to us as we're driving away, knocks, and she gives us a card. And inside the card, it reads, I've given my life to Christ. That would be a great story. But it didn't happen that way. <laughs> she says, thank you for getting my letters. Here's a toy dollar, your pop gift card for the kids. That's still a pretty good story. <laughs> but to be bold and say it, and God loves you as much as God loves me. Have that ambition for your apartment, company, neighborhood. And then secondly, as a new life, let's have a great ambition for this church, for the glory of Christ. We need churches that are like this, that are open, that are, you know, Catholic and Seventh Adventists can come and we could worship together like this and of different colors. Because, you know, when you look at history, even recent wars, all those recent wars are always down by artificial divisions, right? Difference of cultures, they say, right? Tutsis and Hutus. whether it will be Rwanda or Serbian war, or even now in Syria, by difference of ethnicity or religion. People kill each other more easily because of some difference they make essential, and we've got to fight that. And how do we fight it? Not by being political, but being the church, my friends, worshiping together with brothers and sisters, and every other person, every other culture. Yes, because when we do that, how can we be racist when we are growing together in Christ, when we're discipling in Christ together? Even in America, my friends, even in America, just recently there was an uh, expose, uh, exposure of uh, Bank of America that they gave higher rates to Latin Americans and African Americans. Don't tell me that our country is devoid of racism. That's not our main goal. But to bring glory to Christ, we're going to embrace the world, embrace the impossible. I want to plant 50, 100 churches like this, m u l t i e t h n i c churches all around. And so then all the churches will see the way we worship is to be with other cultures because that's the revelation that John had at the end when all the nations came before God and were healed and worshipped. That's our ambition.